Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquity, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And in his word do I hope, my soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning, O Israel's hope is in the Lord. For with the Lord there is great mercy. With him is plenteous redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all their sins. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God, and speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Have you not heard, have you not known, that the Lord our God is an everlasting God, the creator of the heavens of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young shall fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Beloved, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want for anything. For he maketh me to lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, and thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Beloved, we gather together this morning to celebrate and to glorify God, our risen Savior, through his Son, Jesus the Christ, that gives us a hope that is everlasting, a hope that is sure, a promise that when we all get together, what a time, what a time, what a time we will have. Truly, we rejoice for the Spirit of the Lord that is in this place as we gather together to celebrate the life of a beloved servant, son of the true and living God, Brother Lang McConnell, whom God have called from labor to rest and reward. And I'm so glad that you all thought it not robbery um, to come to celebrate his life on this day. Um, as it is blistery outside 
and we see the wind and the trees and the leaves blowing, it reminds us of the breath of the Holy Spirit that reminds us that we are yet alive and that as he breathes upon the earth and the fullness thereof, he also breathes life into each and every one of us. So while we may come with heavy hearts and filled with sorrow, we come also with a spirit of rejoicing and knowing that the promises of our God are true and everlasting. That if we know him in the pardon of our sins, that when we experience death, that is only the beginning of life for those in the body of Christ. So we celebrate not the time that we won't have, but we celebrate the time that we did have. While Mother Guthrie may say that 86 years was a long time, uh, but it was not long enough when you love someone and you long to be with them and you don't want to let them go. But love does not hold on. Love lets go. Love trusts. Love hopes. Love know that God makes no mistakes and that if we know him in the pardon of our sins, though we may not be together physically, we will see each other again in the grave by and by. So on this morning, friends, we have gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of his beloved son, Brother William Sylvester McConnell, who lived 86 years in this life. We come together in grief, but we also acknowledge our human loss. May God grant us grace that in our pain we might find comfort, in our sorrow we might find hope, in death we might find resurrection. Um, I, I do need to know, though, as we gather together for the homegoing celebration of Brother McConnell, are we celebrating y'all's death, too, because y'all seem like there's no life in you at all. Uh, I, I mean, y'all don't seem to look as sad, and, and I don't know what you're going through or, or what you've been through, but I know God brought you through, and this is only for a season that we come to celebrate and to be happy and to rejoice. I'm not trying to diminish the pain and the sorrow that you may be feeling, but I know Brother Lay would be like, y'all not acting like this. No, 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 not at my homegoing celebration. Uh, y'all going to be rejoicing. Y'all going to tell some truth, and some of y'all going to tell some lies, but it's all good uh, because we come to celebrate just our relationship and our kinship one with another. So uh, no matter what you're going through, please give it over to the Lord and know that the Lord will bless and keep. We're going to um, have our opening hymn um, found in the African American hymnal on page 143. The African American hymnal on page 143. His eye is on the sparrow. And as the Lord has his eye on the sparrow, he also has it over you. I'm not going to ask that um, you stand. Will, will you sing better if you stand? Some of y'all don't even want to sing at all. Some of y'all said y'all don't want me to sing. Uh, but if you are inclining, if you are inclined to stand, you may stand. And if you are more comfortable seated, you may remain seated. But let us sing the song with confidence that his eye is on the sparrow and that he is watching both you and I.
nobody else and you always talk to the Lord and know that he's here and attentive to your cries and that he is listening to see what it is that his beloved child is calling on. We will be blessed and prepared to the throne of grace by my colleague in the gospel, Reverend Brown, as she will come and give us the prayer of comfort. Then we will find comfort in the word of God. Um, as Brother Colby Nolte, Nick Nolte, Nick Nolte, um, and Sister Karen and Cara, y'all, y'all, y'all need to come. Y'all know who y'all are. <laughs> Amen. Y'all gonna have to read the names and all that stuff, and then, then y'all gonna get all of them. That's wrong. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> Amen, Pastor. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Come on, church, and let's bless his holy name. Come on with me as we go to the throne of grace for this evening service as we go forward believing that God is still holding you yet. And so God, it is in the spirit, hallelujah, of trust that we come this evening. God, we come because we know that there is no other help that we know. God, we come this morning, Lord God, because we know that you have been our helper in our in our ages past. God, we know, God, that you have a track record with us, God, that you don't leave us nor forsake us. And so right now, God, in the midst of this ongoing celebration, I know somebody, oh God, that's feeling like they have lost their way. And I know somebody, oh God, in our midst is feeling sad and sorrowful, feeling the sting of death feeling the, the pain of loss, but oh God, your word said that you would be a comforter unto us, and so right now, God, we are calling on you because we know your promises were true and that you don't fail us one way or another. God, I, I bless your name this morning. God, we thank you for those who have gathered in this house today. God, I ask, oh God, that they will feel your presence, that they will feel your are watching and waiting. God, we thank you that those of us who are in Christ will be soothing in on the other side. And so we bless your holy name. And it is in the name of Jesus, the righteous Lamb of God, that we say amen. Amen. And bless you.
be moved he who keeps you will not slumber he who keeps israel will neither slumber nor sleep the lord is your keeper the lord is your shade at your right hand the sun shall not strike you by the day nor the moon by the night the lord will keep you from all evil he will keep your life the lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore be the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, verses 13 through 18. The coming of the Lord. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, with them to meet the Lord in the air will be caught up in the clouds, will be caught up in the clouds uh, together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Amen. At this time, we'll ask that Sister Carlin come and read from the book of Revelation, after which we will have a song by Minister Thomas Clark. Revelations 21, verse 1 through 4, and then Heather will come and read. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband.
Many of you know that. Often he had three jobs, okay? And one of his, uh, excuse me, a number of his jobs had one common denominator, and that was driving. Dad loved to drive, and he made it a competition because Dad was an extremist, okay? I remember as a young boy riding, whether it was as 
he was driving bus, even working for the police department, driving tractor trailer. I had opportunities, many opportunities to ride along with him. And we'd have long conversations. And we'd talk about everything. Sometimes I'd fall asleep and he'd say, wake up. Yes. Yeah. And I just know I'll miss those conversations. But like I said, dad was an extremist. There was no one that could drive better than him. He made everything a competition. If he went into a parking lot and he was driving around and another driver made eye contact with him, he would look and he said, I'm going to get that parking spot. And he'd whip through the parking lot and we'd be sitting there in a the car going, oh no. And he'd whip in that parking spot and his favorite phrase was, nanny, nanny, boo, boo, I beat you. <laughs> and he would do that. But he enjoyed driving. And I would ask you right now, how many of you have have or have ever had a Maryland driver's license? I'll raise my hand. Let me see your hands. Have had or ever had a Maryland driver's license? Be thankful that dad was never employed as a driving examiner at the Maryland Vehicle Administration <laughs> because you wouldn't have passed. <laughs> okay. Now dad also went to the extremes on his stories. You could tell him how bad a day or how rough a day you were having but he would always outdo you. He would tell you about his life as a child where he had to walk uphill both ways five miles. He would even go so far as you could say, oh, it's hot outside. I can't go outside. I can't do this. I can't do that. He'd look at you and he'd go, well, there's nothing wrong with, it, with, with you. Get out there. Go do that. When I was growing up, me and Uncle Zeke, we slept in a hollow log and drank muddy water. That's how tough life was for us. And like I said, I'll always remember going to ask him for advice or we're just talking. One thing I never did, I stopped doing, excuse me. I stopped doing was asking him, well, why did you say that, Dad? And he would look at you and he'd go, if a mosquito could pull a plow, just hook him up. <laughs> if I tell you, if I tell you a mosquito could pull a plow, just hook him up. Because he was always right. He knew everything. But he knew that each and every one of you loved him and will miss him. And in closing, I would like to leave you with, with what I believe is kind of a motto that he lived by. And I'll read it. It says, McConnell, now, he is the most perfect man in the world. He is a genius and never wrong. <laughs> See, I, I'm not as good as my brother. I brought my notes up here. <laughs> but, uh, well, first off, I want to thank everybody for coming um, to celebrate my dad. And I would say support the family, but it looks like Pretty much everybody is, man. Um, so thank y'all anyway. But um, I know if he was to see everybody's or all these faces in here, he would um, he probably try to act like he wasn't as excited as he really was. But then he'd probably be talking until it was time for everybody to go to work on Monday. <laughs> um, see, he uh, he tried to play like he was antisocial, but if you really know him, you knew that he loved to be around people and he loved to be around his people, especially. Um, he just, he had a hard time expressing his feelings, but he never had a hard time expressing his opinions. And some of y'all you know, might know that. Um, some of y'all knew him as Lang, some of y'all knew him as Junior, but um, in my opinion, I say this you know, humbly, I think to know him at his best was to know him as dad. Um, I learned you know, everything I know about being a dad from, from him. I made a couple tweaks here and there, but for the most part, we, uh, <laughs> for the most part, he gave me the blueprint um, you know, you don't really appreciate all the sacrifices that your parents make, you know, until you're a parent yourself. Amen. So, so now that, you know, I'm waking up at six and, uh, you know, taking, taking my son to school, I, it's, <laughs> I, I tend to think about, you know, how is he doing this at 70 years old? It couldn't have, it couldn't have been me. It won't be me, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's just, that was just him. Um, sometimes I used to feel a little bad. Because I would feel like he didn't 
spend any time, you know, having hobbies or just, you know, getting enjoyment out of life outside of taking care of making sure we were straight. But now that I've gotten older, I realized that that was, you know, his enjoyment that he got out of life. And that's what he took the most pride in. Um, when I was a kid uh, and he had me in private school, I see Miss Kiki and uh, Mr. Gary. I think I see Trey back there, too. I mean, not Trey, Kalante, my bad. Um, but, yeah, when he had me in private school, he used to tell everybody who was willing to listen that I went to private school, what private school I went to, what celebrities kids went to that school and everything. And um, sorry, Mom, but I hated that school. So, so, I, so I used to hate when um, I used to hate when he used to tell everybody about it, right? <laughs> but um, but you might have saw in the, um, the obituary. My dad was he was born here in Baltimore, but as a kid he lived in South Carolina um, in a little town. No electricity, no running water. Um, he said, according to him, he really did walk five miles to school. Um, you know, all the stuff that we, we tell our kids, you know, was kind of his reality. Um, so as I got older and I really thought about it, I, I, I understood why he took so much pride in, you know, being able to, able to send his kids to private school. Um, because, you know, that little boy from that shack in South Carolina, he was never supposed to be able to send his kid, you know, to that school. So I, I get that as I get older. So, um, you know, I never thought this day would come. Um, I feel like some of the best dads are the ones that you just feel like is invincible and they'll just live forever, you know. But, um, but at the end of the day, the day got to end. So um, the job was well done while he was here. Um, again, thank everybody for coming. And like I said, I'm going to miss him, but I know he's going to be here with us. That's all okay. I got. I would just like to first of all thank Valerie for this opportunity. I really feel privileged and honored to have the opportunities to say a few words today. Well, first of all, I want to just um, say something about uh, what is recorded in the bulletin about his name, about his name because, okay, I see that friends called him Lang and family called him Junior. Well, he is my first cousin. He called my mom at Maybell. We lived in South Carolina. His mom, I called Aunt Carrie, and she lived in Detroit. And then they had a younger sister that we both called Aunt Vernell. And Vernell and Junior, as I would say, and to just make sure we were talking about the right Junior, we would say Junior McConnell. But, and Vernell being the youngest of six siblings that my grandparents had, she and Junior kind of had a little running feud. It was a love kind of thing, but he would come into Baltimore where we spent all of our summers, and sometimes he and his family would come by and have a dinner or something, and she would uh, end the conversation by saying something like, and why do they call you Lang anyway? That really irritates me. You know Lang. You are a McConnell. And don't you forget it. You stole my father's name. <laughs> and then he would say something like, oh, Aunt Vernell, don't be upset. You're not a bad-looking woman, but I... <laughs> but I am more handsome than you are beautiful. And she would just look at him. <laughs> Lang and I are, and his sister Rosemary here from Detroit, who she and I almost share a birthday, but we are only 10 years younger than Lang, so some of our memories go back a lot farther. For example, visiting our grandparents in Glen Burnie, as Junior Lang grew up, as we grew up, Grandmama, well, we would say that Junior's got big eyes, but Grandma's eyes aren't big enough to see him because she just spoiled him. Uh, you know, all of her siblings, my mom, my aunts, my uncles, called her sis. And Junior was the only one that had the
the authority to call her sis also. So we watched him grow up, grow up in Glen Burnie. We watched him turn into a young man, go off to work, and Grandma would spend time with us until it was time for a junior to be coming home. And then she would kind of disappear into the kitchen and she would start making his favorite dishes and we would just wait for him to come from work because he was so funny and so jovial. So he would walk in with his lunch pail and his thermos and put them on the counter and he'll say, what's up, sis? He said, smells pretty good in here today. And he'll start lifting the lids off of the pot. And she saw Junior go wash up and get ready to eat. And he'd be winking at us. Well, <laughs> Thursdays was a very special day at Grandma and Granddaddy's house in Glen Burnie during that time because our treat on Thursday was getting to make homemade ice cream that you actually churned. And they had this wonderful peach tree in the backyard that had some good sweet uh, peaches and granddaddy would get that uh, churn going about the time the junior would come from work and grandma would pick some peaches and peel them and slice them and we're just having a good old time in the backyard in the swing and then after a while granddaddy would holler up to the house junior junior and he pop i'm not home he said <laughs> junior come down here and help these girls with this ice cream. And after a while, you see him coming, and he looks at Granddaddy, and he said, you know, it's time these little girls build some muscles so they'll learn how to <laughs> churn this ice cream. And Granddaddy be looking at him, and he'd be winking at us, you know. But he loved us. He was family and children oriented. He and Grandma had that, comp he and Vernell had the competition going about who was more beautiful and he being more handsome and all of that, but we had a good time. I understand that earlier this year, Jermaine, Jermaine, I'm put you on blast, a very special nephew to my cousin Junior, and they had Jermaine and he had a special relationship, and doing a visit with him, perhaps his last visit, out of that visit, a catalyst was born. I think my cousin Kirk was there, who lives out here, and my cousin Lavoya were there. And as a result of Jermaine's visiting, Valerie, Lavoya, Jermaine, everybody decided, you know, this family needs to get together. Y'all need to have a reunion. Out of that visit, that brunch visit, Jermaine, was planted the catalyst for the Moses and Rebecca Langley family reunion that'll take place this summer in June in Charleston, South Carolina. I look to see you, 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 and all of my other cousins that I'm meeting and seeing for the first time this week in 20 years and or more. Lang won't be there. You know, we had hoped so that, you know, but as God would have it, he's gone to another home. So he won't be there physically with us. But family, let me leave this with you today as is recorded in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. For we know if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen. Um, ushers, if y'all could line up, um, give them usher strolling music to come up to um, in honor of past president. Y'all gonna march up. Y'all don't be rolling your eyes at the pastor. Y'all get over that. Y'all do it every Sunday.
Y'all, don't, don't reach for your pockets or your purses. There's no collection. <laughs> there, there's no collection. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a tribute to Brother Lang, who was um, the chief usher. And it was only befitting that they march in as he ushered everyone in Sunday after Sunday as he stood by the door um, and made those who entered in welcome. At this time, we'll have a tribute from the ushers in his honor. Brother and sister have found it. Anything we can use to memorize our departed member, William McConnell, of this craft. Yes, I hold in my hand a pair of white gloves, which denotes the purity of his life and the willingness to serve humanity. Brother, sister, have you found anything in your search that can serve as a reminder that William, who passed into the silent hand just a little sooner than we, than we once served in the attachment of God's army called church ushers? Yes, I found a gold pen worn by our brother, which shows denominational barriers have been broken and church ushers of all faith have united in one band of Christian love. Brother, brother, sister, have anything we use as a memento that William has acknowledged the super, super masses of death once served in the aisles of his holy temple. Yes, I hold in my hand an emblem of service in the house of the Lord, the badge of a Christian usher. Amen. Does this conclude your ritual? Yes. That's a question. Yes. <laughs> Does this conclude? Amen. Uh, uh, Sister Robin, um, I noticed that the, um, your colleagues had processed in before you could join the procession. Are you doing a solo march in honor of your uncle? You, you can't appear at the back door when it's all done and think you're going to give it a pass. <laughs> so you, you don't want to march, Robin? Pray, all right, okay, yeah, praise the Lord, just check it. Okay, amen, amen. So we are going to continue on in the celebration of life as we will have the reading of the obituary by Sister Cheryl McConnell. If she will come, um, and before we will have um, words from the family from um, my esteemed colleague, past pastor, Reverend Dr. Diane Dixon Proctor, but ask um, Dr. Brown um, if he would like to say something. Um, have to have Dr. Brown say something because it was stated that Brother Lang um, would say that he was the most beautiful one and fine and all of that. Um, but um, Dr. Brown has delusional moments in that um, <laughs> he pledged Kappa Alpha Psi and all of them think they just the prettiest handsome men in the world. Um, so I, I just wanna see if he can give a rebuttal based on a holy way. Um, to Brother Lang's um, state of mind. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm going to do this like my father would always say. 
girl, hurry up and say what you got to say, because I got things to do. <laughs> William Sylvester McConnell, 86, passed away on Friday, March 29th, 2024, at the residence of his son in Fredericksburg, Virginia. William, affectionately called Junior by his relatives and Lang by his friends, was born in Baltimore, Maryland on May 18, 1937, one of eight children to Willie and Carrie Langley McConnell. Lang was raised by his grandparents, Moses and Rebecca, sis, Langley in Severn, Maryland, where he helped his grandfather with a rabbin. He was a proud and responsible young man who graduated from Wally H. Bates High School in 1954. Lang was a devoted husband and father who dedicated his life to his family. He married Shirley Brooks in August 1957, and they had five children. Terrence, Latonya, Cheryl, Karen, and Carla. They raised their family together until Shirley passed away in 1989. Lang found love again with Valerie Thomas, who he married in March 1993. They reared two more children. McKinley and Thomas. Lang was a faithful Christian since his youth. He joined John Wesley United Methodist Church in Glen Burnie, Maryland in 1978 and served as the president of the Usher Board and the president of the trustee board. Lang lived to work while others worked to live. He was a hardworking man with a passion for driving. Throughout his career, he served his various capacities, including cab driver, Baltimore City Police Officer, Maryland Transit Administration Bus Driver, Baltimore Tank Lines Driver, Limousine Driver, and Driver Supervisor at Maryland Chemical Company, from which he retired. Oh, the joy he found behind the wheel of a big old Pete, AKA Peterbilt truck. Lang's zest for life extended to his leisure activities. He was an avid fan of the Orioles and Ravens. Lang cherished the hours spent at the pool table with his brother-in-law, the late Reverend Dr. Clarence Morton. He dedicated time to watching various sports from basketball, baseball, and football to golf and tennis during off seasons. Lang often reminisced about his time playing with basketball legend Elgin Baylor, his opportunity to play professional baseball, racing in Crofton, and hunting in Maryland and Mississippi. Lang was preceded in death by his wife, Shirley Brooks McConnell, stepson, McKinley Jamal Thomas, father, William, I'm sorry, Willie McConnell, mother, Carrie McConnell Williams, stepfather, Will Williams, four sisters, Orly Riley, Pauline Riley, Maxine Dixon, and Doretha Williams, and two brothers, Chesley McConnell and Irvin Williams. Memories of Lang will forever be cherished with his wife, Valerie, sons Terrence, Jerry McConnell, and Thomas McConnell, daughters Latonya McConnell-Williams, Cheryl McConnell, Karen McNulty, and Carla, Michael Sauter, grandchildren Melanie, Stetney, Liana, Tyler, Colby, Kennedy, Mariah, and Kaysen step-grandchildren Michael and Mercedes, great-grandchildren Cassidy, Carly, and Kylie, sister Rosemary Williams, brothers-in-law Carl Brooks, Natalie Brooks, Daniel, Lori Thompson, I'm sorry, Lori Thomas Sr., sisters-in-law Martha Bullock, Fields, Sandy Jackson, Betty Morton, Virginia, Wilbert Smith, Angela Smoot, Edna Thomas, Washington, Betty Washington, a host of nieces, nephews, and cousins, and devoted friend, Llewellyn Gaither. Amen. <laughs> you know, uh, I happen to tell Dr. Moore some time ago that you cannot be in John Wesley United Methodist Church 
without knowing that there are numerous cappers in here. Come on, Dr. Brown. <laughs> and he began to try to boast his gold and black. And you notice I was very careful not to put a gold tie on this morning. <laughs> I didn't want to just go into full Kappa mode, so I said, I'll, I'll see him when we get there. Amen. We'll have our fun. But let me tell you, there's something special about those Kappa men. Ask my wife. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm standing, I would like to pay tribute to Lang. Uh, if you notice on the multi-purpose room back there. In 1994, there was a, a stone laid for that building. Lang was then the chairperson of trustees. And guess who was his vice? Yours truly. Lang and I served together, and I would say he, was, he served well. He was always comical, but he was always serious. He knew exactly what he wanted, and he knew exactly how to get it. He knew exactly how to lead, and he made the rest of us follow. And so we thank God for the time and the spirit of him. I thank God for his family, Valerie and Cheryl and all, and the, and the twins who I can never remember apart. When I see you together, I know who you are, but I just cannot get the names always. But to you all, I say, God is a refuge, which is the motto of my church with my wife. He's a refuge in time of trouble. And when we trust in him and we lean and depend on him, everything will be all right. Mm -hmm. One day we'll see him again and we'll be able to praise God and enjoy God around with all of the saints of the ages. And we'll sit at God's feet and be blessed. Well, to these esteemed reverends here and to our pastor John Wesley, my friend, my daughter and son in the ministry, I always call them that, you know. <laughs> but it's good to greet you, family. And as I look at you today I, as family of Lang McConnell, I, I, I had to ask a couple of folk who you were. Then they told, I, oh. My, how he has grown. I remember my son always said, why do people always think you're never going to grow? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want you to know, family, that Brother Lang left some light, a pathway. Mm -hmm. And as everybody has come up here to speak, they, they told you about that pathway that Lang left for you all. Uh, they can't tell Karen and uh, and and uh, call apart. But when I see Mike, I can tell him apart. <laughs> and I look out, and many of you, I've I've baptized you as babies, I've confirmed you when you went to the call of Christ. I've married you. I've sat with you. And as I think back on Lang, I met him the first time I came to serve you all over. Oh, over 20 years ago, he was at the door. He was the usher. He greeted me and brought me in. And through the years, because of Valerie, we became friends. Valerie planned this one night, this, this date night for us. And, uh, Reese and y'all went, and uh, we went to a play. And I think it was at that time Lyon got to, got to know my husband Marvin and the two of them, I know, uh, Terrence, you were talking about the little things that your, that your daddy said. Well, the two of them, they were jonesing on each other and, and uh, talking about each other. And if those of you who know Marvin, he says one or two words that might not be really nice and, and they got <laughs> together. And, and he said uh, uh, to Lang, oh, shh. You can't talk like that in front of the pastor. He said, pastor's my wife. <laughs> but we had a good time that night. Valerie had picked a play. And we all enjoyed the play. And 
you could tell the men were just there because they didn't know any other way to tell their wives that they didn't want to go. <laughs> but lying was a beacon of light. And I could honestly say I, there was not a Sunday hardly that lying was not at the door. Amen. He guided people in. He smiled or he didn't smile. But Lang was a man of character. Now, I heard a whole lot of people say what Lang was, but nobody said what he wasn't. He wasn't a no-nonsense kind of guy. He would smile at you, but if he didn't like you, you would know pretty soon. <laughs> he wasn't a man to be pretentious. He, he was not a man to let you know how much he thought about his family. As I listened to Thomas today, I didn't realize he didn't like that little school. I thought, thought he was doing so well at the school and, <laughs> and he looked good. And Thomas, I saw your son today. I, I asked, I asked, I said, I asked, where? She said, that's Thomas. I said, well, I might not have recognized Thomas, but I recognize that little boy. <laughs> that is a little Thomas. But lying was very much a family man. And sometimes I would feel sorry for his kids because he was a strict family man. And he didn't take any nonsense from anybody. And so as we think about him today, I want you to think about him in light of the pathway that he trod, the jobs that he had, the hard worker that he was. And for all of you in this family, young people alike, you ought to realize that Lang worked hard because he wanted to make sure that he, he was able to give you everything that he could give you. His cousin talked about the family and uh, how everybody cared for him. Well, where, while I was here, John Wesley, I remember how much the folk at John Wesley cared for Lang, how they, much they respected him, and how the loss was felt when he and Valerie moved down to, wasn't it Alabama? Yeah. I had the occasion to visit him in Alabama, and he came up to me and he said, did he pick me up at the airport? I came down to see Jamal, and, and I was so glad to see him. He looked so good. I said, boy, this Alabama is, is agreeing with you. And he looked at me and he said, did Marvin see you before you left home this morning? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I, th I think he did. He saw me. He said, and he approved of what you had on? <laughs> and I said, well, I didn't ask him. He said, well, I said, I guess you don't like what I have on. I don't even remember what I had on. And he said, well, I don't know. And he kept going. And this morning, as I was getting dressed to come here, I thought about Lang. Lang was been on my mind because I said, Valerie said she wanted me to bring some words to the family. And I know all of you know how dearly Lang thought about his family. And so when Val and, and Lang moved back here, Val called. I said, oh, you're back. He said, yes, Lang wanted to be here near the family. And so this morning, as I was struggling, getting ready, I put on three or few, four outfits. <laughs> I put on this suit. I said, well, I guess I should wear a suit. And then I had this purple outfit to put on, but I put a little weight on since I went on that cruise <laughs> last week, and that was a little too tight. And I said, hmm, Lang would have something to say about this. <laughs> so when I finally got dressed, I said, it would be fitting for me to go and say, Marvin, how do I look? He looked at me and he said, that's a trick question. <laughs> I said, no, how, how do I look? And he looked around first, you know, and nobody there but me and him. And he said, well, you look fine. I said, is that it? He said, you look fabulous. You look great. I said, okay, I can go out this morning to Lang's service and know that Lang's looking down on me and know that a yes, Marvin approves of what I wore. <laughs> But when you think of Lang, you think of your heritage. Your heritage does not stop with Lang. It, it just carries.
carries on. I know I saw somebody in here that was pregnant. They're carrying on the family. Did I see somebody who was having a baby? <laughs> but you all keep the family going. <laughs> because as you keep the family going, you understand that Lang was not only a man who worked hard, who gave his all. He was a great man of faith. And his faith meant a lot to him. And so the heritage that he leaves with you today, it's not a heritage of uncertainty. It's a heritage of certainty that a great man, a good man, gave you what you need to do the best that you can in life and to make a difference. I know that uh, Carla and, and Karen work as nurses and they are making a real difference. When Marvin was very, very ill and he was in the hospital, they were right there. And I went over and, and said, he, she said, don't worry, I'll be behind making sure that he gets everything he needs. And so as I, I look out at all of you this morning, remember the heritage that Lang left for you and know that yours is the memory of a good man and how Lang touched your life. You know, he's waiting for you on the beyond. And I truly believe that when people go on to heaven, if you want to have a talk with them, all you have to do is look up and say, hey, Dad, I messed up today, or hey, Dad, I did this today, or hey, Dad, I, I, I'm thinking about doing this, and somehow Lang is going to be able to get the answer to you. He's going to comfort you and strengthen you. And so when you think about your husband, Valerie, Think about the heritage that he left you and you can keep on smiling. For your children, each of you children, you think about what your dad did and how hard he worked to make you what you are and you look down on your children and say, okay, you got some big shoes to fill, but get on it. And then the grandchildren that may not know him as well great-grandchildren, all of you, the sisters and brothers and nieces and nephews and cousins that are planning to go to that family union, you go and you represent Lang because the family must go on. We must make sure that we never forget our heritage. There's a pathway of light that Lang left for each of you. Walk in the light. It's a beautiful light. It's a light that God is shining straight for you. And Lang McConnell is right on that light, making sure that you always do the best you can with what he has given you. Amen. protection mm. God is my all in all hey. God is 
and on. God is my joy in the time.
Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, O Lord, for all that has transpired thus far, the singing of songs and the reading of scripture, the testimony of the saints, the coming together in spirit and in truth. And now, Lord, in this brief meditation, I ask, O Lord, that you will anoint my ears to hear your voice, my heart ever to be yoked with you. Humble me, O gracious master, where I may be filled with self. Raise me, O God, where I may not be quite enough. Hide me, Lord, behind your cross. Shape me, break me, make me, and mold me. But gracious master, never cast me from your care. For this is your servant's prayer, prayed in the matchless name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. 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 Indeed, we have had a good time thus far in this homegoing celebration as we have heard testimony and have witnessed just the awesome man that Brother McConnell, William Sylvester Lang McConnell was, is, and forever shall be. Um, he was a fine man, a stately man, a handsome man, not as handsome as I, but created in the image of the Lord. I only said that to see if y'all were paying attention to what I am saying. And truly, God has blessed us where there are illusions of things that are and are not. People are confused and stuck on things. And my colleague in the gospel, again, Brother Brown, talked about how handsome he was. And he said, as a testament to his good looks, um, that he was able to pull his wife and that we could ask her and she would bear witness to that fact. But what he did not say was um, she was seated next to me. Um, and you notice he is on the outside and I was in the middle. Um, and in all of this stuff that we talk, you know, my, my colleague, he, he was talking about how fine he was. And, and I tell you how fine I am, and y'all can see that. And Brother Lang was fine, and he would tell you that there still is one finer than all three of us put together. And that is our creator, Father God, who knows each and every one of us. He knows every spot and every blemish and every shortcoming and thing that we do and should not do and that we do that we ought to do that he knows us intimately inside and out. And God, um, through his son, Jesus the Christ, had his finger of love upon Brother Lang. And he knew when he would wink, when he was getting over, when he was um, jesting, and when he was serious, and when he was um, trying to be that backseat driver and professing that he was the perfect driver, the one who knew all things and was infallible, but yet perfect here on earth, but yet striving towards perfection, but is perfected now in Christ Jesus by the profession of his faith. You know, we all think more of ourselves than we ought to sometimes, but God always sends us back to a reality check. And I am so glad that though I did not know Brother Lang personally up close, nor had the opportunity to pastor him, that I was able to sit here and to listen to the testimony of the saints of those who knew him best. I know that Brother Lang had some mess that went with him. I, I knew that he could talk some trash and, and sometimes maybe stretch the truth and maybe lied a little. And, and I also know that he was in the house of the Lord and he had a blessed assurance of knowing that Jesus was his. And beloved, one of the things that we need to understand in life that we are not going to be perfect. We are going to make mistakes along the way. But if we live the best life that we can in hopes that we are living a life that is congruent with our faith, that if we are trying to be the best us that we can be through Christ Jesus, then we're doing something that is right. We are not going to do everything that we ought to do and say everything that we ought to say. But if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus is our Lord, then we shall be saved. And the things that we are not will be made brand new and we will be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Brother McConnell was a faithful servant of the Lord. He had one of the most tough and difficult jobs in service in the church. He was an usher. That means he saw you coming in with your attitudes and, and all that other mess, but yet he still greeted you with a smile. He would direct you to where you needed to go, and sometimes he would tell you where to go that was not in the church. I'm just saying, keep it real and all that other stuff. Brother McConnell, I, I believe, would tell us, if, if he would tell us the truth. 
um, and he would tell us the truth in love. And I was reading the scripture and I found myself going to the book of Psalm. They're recorded in the 27th book. And um, I'm going to read both from the New International Version and then from the translation that I like to read from in a more contemporary context. From the New International Version, the Psalm of David, the 27th book. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemy and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an enemy besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe. In his dwelling, he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent. I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. I'm going to stop there with that translation because I want to go to the message translation. Eugene Peterson said it this way. Light, space, zest, that's God. So with him on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. When vandals, hordes ride down, ready to eat me alive. Those bullies and toughs fall flat on their faces. When besieged, I'm calm as a baby. When all hell breaks loose, I'm collected and cool. I'm, ask, I'm asking God for one thing and only one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. That's the only quiet, secure place in a noisy world, the perfect getaway far from the buzz of traffic. God holds me head and shoulders above all who try to pull me down. I'm headed for a place to offer anthems that will raise the roof. Already I'm singing God's song. I'm making music to God. Listen, God, I'm calling at the top of my lungs. Be good to me. Answer me. When my heart whispers, seek God, my whole being replied, I'm seeking him. Don't hide from me now, Lord. You've always been right there for me. Don't turn your back on me now. Don't throw me out. Don't abandon me. You've always kept the door open for me. My father and mother walked out and left me, but God took me in. Point me down your highway, God. Direct me along a well-lit street. Show my enemies whose side you're on. Don't throw me to the dogs, those liars who are out to get me, filling the air with their threats. I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness in the exuberant earth. Stay with God. Take heart. Don't quit. I'll say it again. Stay with God. And beloved, as we hear this passage of scripture, I know that Brother Lang had a blessed assurance and a promise and a hope in the Lord above. That in his time of trouble, he would seek the Lord. And he knew that the Lord was on his side. Came hell or high water. If he couldn't trust on anybody, he knew that his help was in the Lord. And many of us find ourselves going through trial and tribulation. We're stressed and pulled on every part and every side. We find ourselves oftentimes looking down and finding it difficult to look up. We find life's problems and situations just tearing and eating at our heart. And we wonder where we can find our help and our hope. But beloved, we have to learn that we have to have a blessed assurance that is not found here on earth, but in the God above. Brother Lang was not a perfect man, but he served a perfect God who was perfecting him along the way. 
He had been through hard times and he has seen trouble. He has seen struggles and through it all, the Lord brought him each step away of the way. Sickness could not devour him. Racism could not devour him. Fatigue could not devour him. Anything that came his way, he always rose to the occasion and he kept the faith and he fought the good fight. His hope his faith was in the Lord, and that is why he could have a blessed calm and an assurance even in the time of trouble. When things didn't add up, it would always add up by the grace and the mercy of the God that he served. He understood that he could not conquer life, but he presented himself bigger than life because he knew that if he could go to God in prayer, everything would be all right. Not only did God bless him with one good wife, but he blessed him with two good wives. Yes. I say, what a man, what a man, what a man. <laughs> what a man. I, I, he had five kids with one and then came back and blessed and, and had two more. To God be the glory because he had God's favor. That life did not end or begin with one person. But it continued on a legacy that was fulfilled and blessed and ordained by God. See, it's not how long you live, but how well you live during the time you are here. Yes, yes. And Lang touched each and every one of us in different ways. Each one will have a story, a memory, something special that you can remember and equate to. Every time you drive into a parking lot. You're going to find yourself racing to beat to some other person to the parking space, and you're not going to understand why I did it, but it's in you. You're going to find yourself able to go to the bus stop and get on the bus and ride to the store or go to the school, but no, you're going to walk five miles because it's in your DNA. Somebody's going to tell you something, but you're not going to be able to believe it because you know that what you are saying is right because... That's just who you are. Brother Lang knew how to enjoy life. He loved the O's, though he would have been mad last night. <laughs> As he would have been up there wearing his jersey and faithfully going out to support the young man who was the number one prospect, and everybody went to see him and was in hopes that he would get his first hit and struck out three times. I, I, I don't know, Lang, but I could imagine that, that he would have had some words to say, both encouraging <laughs> and, and words that we understood. He loved the Ravens, and though he did not live to see them win another Super Bowl, he still is coming. I hope next year, but it's coming. But he was loyal and he was faithful to his sports teams, to his family, and to all he loved in his church. He served with gladness yes. and he had a servant's heart mm -hmm. because everything he did was not about glorifying himself, but about lifting up somebody else. Yes a law enforcement officer. Nobody wants to be police anymore. Driving a bus. I drove a bus and people plucked your last nerve. <laughs> but yet he drove people and got people to where they needed to be. What, what was old Pete? What was it? What was it old Pete? What was it that he drove? Peter built truck. He let you drive it. He let you ride in it. He let you look at it. He let you wash it. Uh, yeah, but you could drive that though too, though. You would have made it look even better. <laughs> to God be the glory. But amen. You know, but he had his loves. But there was no greater love. Then he had for his Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, Amen. and for each and every one of you in his own special way. And who Lang was to me is not who Lang is to you or who he may be to somebody else, but he was all of ours for the season that we had him. 
and he left his fingerprint of love upon each and every one of us. And I'm glad that his body is not here because we are only here for a season and for a time. And if we are so fixated on the body, we can't remember the spirit that resides and lives in each and every one of us. You're going to find yourself maybe tilting your head the way he did, saying something that he said, going a place that he had went to. I, you, you know, I don't know if, if, if Lang wore, wore socks with garters. Um, oh, he didn't do that. Uh, my father did that. And I, I said I never would until I went into the military and we had to wear shirt stays and keep our socks and our shirts together. But the things that we say we never will, somehow, some way, somewhere along the line, you're going to revert back to those ways. My beloved sister says she don't, she don't, she don't, um, she was talking about the days of, of when um, her mother made, made um, meals for him and made sure that y'all would take it down to him on the job when he was working and all of that. You don't find ladies like that nowadays. Uh, my wife told me when I married her that she didn't cook and I thought she was joking. <laughs> Near 20 years later, she, we didn't need a kitchen in the house. That could have been a man cave because she visited. Don't y'all go telling. But in each case, he surrounded himself with people who knew how to be their best them and to make him his best him. And I say on this day as we continue to live on, to allow his spirit to live inside each and every one of us. Have a blessed assurance in the same God that he had, a faith that is unshakable or unbreakable. If you want to see him again, make sure you know the God that he knew and the pardon of his sins. Yes, you know some things about Lang that I don't know, but I know the most important thing about him, and that is that he is a child of the true and living king and he professed with his mouth and believed in his heart that Jesus was the Lord. Yes. And that means that he has a place, a spot reserved in glory for him. Amen. Now the question is, do you have a place in a space reserved in glory for you? Amen. Because if you want to see him and all who have died in glory before us, the only way you will see them again is knowing the Lord for yourself. Yes. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what your denomination is. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what your orientation may be. I don't care how often you come to church or how much money you put into church. If you want to see one another again, but more importantly, if you want to be saved from the penalty of sin and to see the God that we profess is Lord, give your life to the Lord today. And he will accept you and receive you when this cruel world that we live in always has a reason to push us away. It's the Lord that always draws and welcomes us in. Amen. Try him for yourself. Lang did. And now he is asleep and waiting till the trumpet sounds when all those who are asleep in Christ will be called from slumber and awakened to the glory of the Lord. So don't think that they having the party of all parties up there. Lang ain't playing or running. Um, no Boston playing spades. He's not running the table on, on, on his brother-in-law, the pastor, who he would play billiards with. He's not eating up all the peach ice cream before you get there. He's not talking trash or, or rocking marathon walks and, and doing all that he did. But we will all get there in the sweet by and by together. And what a time it will be. So I encourage you to cry if you got to cry. But wipe your tears. Rejoice, rejoice, and rejoice. And know that his spirit continues to live on, not only in you, but in each and every one of us. And this is not goodbye. But we will see him in the sweet by and by. Amen. Beloved, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And the party is not going to stop because you know that people of color. 
in all hues of the rainbow. Love to eat. Some of y'all only came because y'all knew it was a repast. <laughs> No, I'm telling the truth, because, you know, at funerals, you, 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 you see people pushing and trying to be first in line, even before the family and all of that. But I want you to know that there is plenty for everybody. And we hope that the fellowship will continue as we move from the sanctuary to the fellowship hall. That as we break bread and as we continue to laugh and to reflect and to rejoice and to remember and to draw comfort and strength one for, from another um, in this time of death, um, but yet new life that we can not let the party in but that it continues until we all come to see Jesus for ourselves don't let this be the last gathering um, where's my, my sister you 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 who who spoke of um, the family reunion where are you at now, now you were ne negligent, and I, 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 I don't mean to call you. Well, yes, I do, because I did. <laughs> but I noticed that as you were giving the invitation, and, and you, you said, you, 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 and you. But you didn't say you, you, <laughs> you, you. <laughs> oh, Okay. Because, see, what I was going to do was um, there was a scene in the movie, Poetic Justice, and, and, and they were riding in the mail truck, and there was a family reunion, and they stopped up, and, and, and he said, Cousin Jim, Cousin Jim, and they just showed up. And if you didn't invite me, I was just going to show up. <laughs> I wasn't going to stay long, but I was going to get a rib or two. <laughs> But to God be the glory. Y'all stay connected. And don't let this be the only time that y'all get together. Um, it's sad when, when the saints of God only see, uh, see each other at times such as this. And then we always make the promises and the pledges that, that we're we, we going to see each other. We're going to see each other. I'm going to call you. Um, and, and then once we get the funeral shirt um, with the picture of our, our deceased loved one, we wear it and then we go on. After a month's time, we got to stop doing that. We got to see each other each and every time that we can and call one another and celebrate the life that we have so that in times like this, we're not just crying and saying, I miss him, I miss her, um, but it won't be any guilt, but just all celebration. So we're going to have the um, benediction. I'm going to ask Reverend uh, um, Brown um, if she would give us um, the benediction. Um, and then we will move to the fellowship hall as we will have our recessional. Do you, do you mind, Reverend Brown? Oh, 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 okay. Um, do, you, do you mind, Pastor? <laughs> me, me, me. I, I, I want you to be mad or, or what? Oh, okay, all right, Reverend Brown. Won't we stand for the benediction? Now, O oh God, we do thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed your people, even in under the circumstances, to come together to lift up your holy name. God, now as we leave this place and go to the other side and fellowship, have something to eat, God. May we be nourished by that. And so, God, now we ask that you will continue to be with us, go before us, continue to be beside us, stay behind us, and be beneath us. For, God, we need you. And we ask, oh, God, that you will keep us in your care. And it's in the righteous, the holy, the majestic, the magnificent, name of Jesus. There's no other name in heaven or on earth that is above that name. And the people of God said amen, amen. and amen. amen. Thank God. If you all would allow us to recess out and then the family will follow immediately.
immediately there behind. 